Good afternoon, everyone. So it's almost four. Let's get started. And welcome to the Provost Lecture Series. And this is our fifth one. We started last November and it has been going very strong. And here is just uh, some background information for those of you who are here the first time. And so today we're going to celebrate um, Professor Olf Skoglund. Before I do that, again, I just want to thank everyone from the provost office. They have been very helpful dealing with all the logistics and people from uh, CPR and also um, the president, uh, the president's office, and everybody else who helped to make this series possible. And today's speaker is um, our dear colleague, Ulf Skoglund. And this is um, the abstract he, sh he shared with us to post online. As you can see, Ulf um, is from Sweden. And he moved to Oist um, in 2010. So he is one of the originals at Oist. And uh, since then, he has built a, a very successful uh, unit. And he also has been the dean for the OIS Graduate School since 2018. And Ove's research expertise is um, cryo-EM and electron tomography. And so we're going to learn quite a bit today uh, during his talk. And so what I learned about Ove was actually before I came to OIST. That was April 2014. And the topic was related to space allocation. And I'm sure many of you have personal experience how to fight for space or how to acquire space. Um, I, I decided to join OIST in August 2014. Since I already had experience from other universities, I decided I'm going to start the process ahead of schedule and making sure I get what was promised. And so I, I contacted at the time the VP John Dickerson, who is here. And some of you probably still remember him. And he told me, yes, so your lab space is not ready. It's lab three. It won't be completed in 2015 but uh, we set aside some space for you. So you can go to the, the basement level, level A in lab two, and wait for your space for a year. Fine. So I had some email back and forth, and, and talking to John Dickerson, April 15. So many, many emails, and he said, Amy, nice try, but not so fast. We still need to accommodate other incoming faculty, blah, blah, blah. And, and so the space you see between Elliot's and Old Space is not going begging. And so, so um, from that point on, I know, I realize Ove is a very important person. <laughs> and the space is already set aside for Ove. And so this picture is actually uh, shared with me um, by Ove and, and your RUA. Now I understand why you and John Dickinson, you guys are very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I have learned from Ove, since Ove and I, so we've been, our office are next to each other for the past eight years. So I learned from Ove that, yeah, just, don't take everything too seriously. Be reasonable. Be a good colleague. And do whatever you can to achieve what you want to achieve. And so since then, we actually had some really good collaborations with OVS unit. Here are some papers. So we learned um, certain techniques from his group, how to culture bacteria, and uh, his former postdoc also helped us to perform cryo-EM and other um, um, very important imaging techniques. What I also have learned from Ove, you need a reliable car. <laughs> Especially, it needs to be good and fast and furious, but safety first. So you can see throughout the years, so Ove upgraded his cars. <laughs> 
And I also learned from of how to write proposals in Japan. So I remember after I submitted my first proposal, I was very hopeful I would get my proposal funded, and of course not. So I, uh, I think that was June 20, 2015. So I complained to Ulf to next door, and he told me, this is all wrong. I showed him my proposal. It's like too many details, too scientific. So you have to write the proposal using manga style. And that was super helpful. I, um, I adopted Ulf's proposal writing techniques, and, and so far, so good. I learned from Ulf as well, be a good mentor. And food, especially cakes, are very important. So Ulf's first PhD student, Faisal, has been um, very successful. So he's uh, now an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. And uh, so Ulf's unit, they, they regularly have um, social events and making sure everybody's happy. And so, this, so these photos are, are shared with me from your unit members. So you can kind of see the, the progression of your unit from 2010, 2013, 15, and 2017. So I want everybody to pay attention to the pictures of Ulf. Okay, so what I want to illustrate is that Ulf has never changed <laughs> from, uh, so that was many years ago, uh, was Habu or somewhere, and when, when, you're, w w when your kids are still a lot younger, and this is from 2015, this is from November 2022. And so I don't know what's your anti-aging secret. <laughs> Maybe always wear hats, uh, or Habu, that, or Okinawa suits you. And most importantly, Of told me you need to be excited about your research. Maybe that's what has kept you forever young. And so Of's expertise is electron tomography. And so it involves uh, sample preparation. You have to use the microscopy. And at the end, you have to perform reconstruction uh, to create this 3D visualization. And so Ulf is going to go through all of these techniques in more details. And, but uh, he shared this slide with me. I, I think you used the same one when you introduced uh, Ichiro. Uh, so I, I'm sure this is, holds very dearly to you. It involves dance. And so hopefully we're going to, sh to see some demo at the end of your lecture. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand this over to Ulf after your lecture. So we're going to present you some gifts and uh, for everybody else. So after the lecture um, outside, so we'll serve snacks and coffee. And also, uh, please uh, be mindful um, to prevent COVID. So with that, I will hand the floor to Ulf. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Do you all hear me? Yes. Interesting question. Is there somebody in here who doesn't hear me? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for this very nice introduction. I, I think that um, it's a bit of a, one of my nerves when it comes to my professional activities during all these years, and that is that I actually think science is fun. So, um, you know, I think that's true for really a majority in here. Science is fun. And so uh, when I now took my vacation, uh, which happened to be from uh, some time ago, um, then I realized that I actually still want to be at the department. Uh, so I'm in, inside my office fixing up things and trying to finalize things. Except today. So I realized that my calendar was soon filling up with all kinds of strange stuff. Uh, ju but just today. So already tomorrow I'm free again, sort of. Um, I. Before I really start into this, I would like to say that I've, as you know, 
have had two functions here. So I've been uh, the regular professor, sort of, and now I uh, transform from f during the night of March 31 to April Fool's Day uh, into a professor emeritus. I don't, still don't know if I change color or something like that, but uh, I will be a new kind of person on that date. All right, so, but I was also a dean for a long time. Uh, now it's approaching five years. Uh, and with the transition time, uh, it's actually about five years already. And uh, I would say that because I'm not going to talk about the, the deanship here, it will be about my research. Um, the graduate school here is composed of quite a lot of uh, sections, five of them, and also a lot of very, very good people. So I would like to say that uh, although I'm not talking about that here in my time, I would like to say to you that I really appreciated uh, my time as a dean for the grad school. It's been very rewarding to me and I've learned a lot about human nature, uh, which is really quite a lot of fun. All right, now let me get into this. So I call this a quest to enable viewing individual proteins at 10 angstrom resolution. Now, why do I say it like that? Well, because I was trained as a protein crystallographer, and that was my PhD. And so I did uh, some structures there, and then as postdoc, well, it had to be protein crystallography again, so I did uh, virus crystals, virus structures. And then I realized that what really intrigued me with the viruses was the inside of the virus. I'm not saying that any of these things is better than anything else. It's just what I was intrigued by. And it turned out that there was no method to look at individual not repeating parts. Uh, so I decided to uh, actually develop tomography. I had just spent a couple of weeks with Aaron Klug's lab in MRC in Cambridge and they said, well, it doesn't work. You need to have repeating things, but if you can really solve the equations about alignment and everything, it's okay. Maybe you can try. So, of course, uh, I did it. <laughs> because as soon as somebody said to me that you can't do it, I will, I'm always wondering if that's based on you know, some mathematical proof, or they just think you can't do it. Uh, in this case, I was pretty sure that they just hadn't put their mind to it in Cambridge. Uh, they wanted to reach high resolution very quickly and went the way of, this one was symmetrizing uh, molecules, um, and uh, Henderson and his colleagues, they went with, uh, instead using crystals, 2D crystals. So I wanted to start, and the, in the beginning I couldn't get better than about 8, 8.5 nanometer in 3D, but it was a very large particle. Uh, so I wanted to reach a level where you can uniquely define structural elements, and that's about one nanometer, give or take a little bit. So everybody there in Sweden in particular said, no, you can't do it. So step by step, I've been increasing the resolution all the time. And as you will see towards the end here, we are actually there. So what is tomography? It's the same technique you use in older times of radar and also in human reconstructions with CT scanners in hospitals. And basically, and let's see if this works. Can you see this red dot somewhere in the middle? OK, so you have an object and you project with a beam through it and you record pictures like this. And if you just record one slice, like a line on each photograph, you can fold that back with back projection mathematics and you have one slice in there. So if you proceed through with all the slices you can have here, you reconstruct the object like a sliced up piece of bread 
right? And then, of course, after that, you can turn it around in all kinds of directions. You have a 3D uh, uh, volume. Now, this is done in all of these. It's very common with tomographic principles today. So you have it in, as I said, radar, older types. The newer radar is, they have introduced a, little bit, a bit more steps, but basically, theoretically backwards, it's, it's tomography and uh, etc. And tomography can be in several dimensions. So you can go from lines to 2D or you can go from pictures to 3D etc. All right, so tomography in, in, uh, in a way when you look at it and you go over to the Fourier space instead, um, there are people here who don't know what that is, but it's like diffraction space. Uh, and, or the focal plane in a lens setup. That's where you have a Fourier space. Well, in in that term, crystallography is a special case of tomography, because tomography doesn't require that you have any symmetry or whatever. It's like for crystallographers, P1 symmetry isn't in there unless you're uh, imposing it somehow. Uh, so if you have a bit of a molecule in there, you see the molecule and everything else in there in, you, in your object. The problem is in when you record the data. So in electron microscopes, you want to record all these different directions like super stereo somehow. But limitations with the specimen holder, etc., makes it very, very difficult to record 360 degrees. There are lots of lamps who have tried this out, and it's so far not successful to high resolution. And uh, one of them told me that when they make a holder so that they can start rotating the specimen, the energy dissipation in the materials makes it start wobbling. And that's very difficult. But maybe in the future, uh, people will be able to create specimen holders so that you can actually uh, rotate the specimen all the way around. It's um, missing some data. It means that you have a deficiency in the 3D reconstruction. So you have lower resolution in certain directions than others. But it's not as bad as it sounds, and you will see later on that in our 3D reconstructions, we hardly even see it nowadays, the effect of it. So what do you do? Well, let's take a normal morning. You go to the lab and you prepare the specimen. You put the specimen in the electron microscope, and you automatically collect all the data. And, and then you transfer the data over to your computer. In our case, it's usually IMAX, but it works even on machines like this one, an I, uh, Back Pro. And uh, after some calculations, later the same day, you can then uh, view your structure in 3D. This is an antibody <laughs> that you see over here. So the process in this particular case, zoom over, and it's like a few hours. Um, but the specimen, if you really want to not miss any details, one of the best ways is to use frozen, frozen hydrated. So it means that the specimen is the electron microscope grid with the specimen on here. You don't see it here, but it's a small, small drop, a couple of microliters or so, uh, containing your specimen, and you s have it so much smeared out as possible over the surface. And then you shoot it down into liquid ethane that is cooled by liquid nitrogen. Okay? And this freezing process here is so fast that you don't form any ice here. You know, ice is very bad because it, it's bigger in volume. 
So if you have cells or whatever in there, they burst if you do it. You might know that if you have strawberries and you accidentally freeze them in the fridge, right? You take them out and thaw them and they are just saggy blobs, right? That's what's happening. The ice destroys the cells. But with this procedure, you can actually uh, preserve the specimen because it's so fast. And it's even faster than this looks like because it's a transition temperature at minus 44 to 45. So the very, very small temperature interval, there is a phase transition and you get the solid material. There are some tricks. And one of the tricks is to, when you do the plunging into liquid ethane, it has to be controlled. Because if you do things in, uh, here you see evaporation velocity in nanometers per second. Well, your specimen is hopefully something like below 50 nanometers, right? And if, if you see here that you evaporate like 50 nanometer per second, yep, uh, then you don't want to do it in dry climate. So that's why people use special humidity chambers when they prepare the grid and then they shoot it down in a fraction of a second in, so that they don't lose so much uh, water. If you lose water in your uh, very thin layer, the concentration changes tremendously of different components, right? So it's very important to uh, have a control on this one. We call it molecular electron tomography and it removes the step that comes after this, removes shot noise. I'll talk about that. But what it is, is you have your specimen on a grid that you photograph, and there are some black dots here, which are gold markers that you can align everything on, down to two and a half angstrom or something like that. And then uh, you can t you can take the tilt series by tilting, and then you can reconstruct. And then this is where your headache starts, because when you look at this one, if you still have a specimen to look at, it means you haven't irradiated much, because it's sensitive to electron dose. So uh, the, what you have down here is a molecule which is reasonably well to look at if you choose a low resolution, like five nanometer or worse, normally. You can, in some cases, go to higher, but you get a lot of noise in there. And that's because the, uh, you use such a low radiation that you see the f fluttering of your detector in terms of uh, intensity. I mean, you know how it is to go in a room like this. If we lower the, temp the light here more and more and more and more finely, you will just see gray things in here. You won't see color and it will look grainy. Huh? That grainy stuff is what you have in here along with your reconstruction. However, you can add a step and that's what we have done. And this added step means that you start with this number four here and then you, you actually refine First of all, you check up whether the 3D reconstruction fits your data or not. If it doesn't fit the data, because it could be scaling error or kinds of things numerically, then you can fix it. But a very important thing is that because you know the variance, you know it's a detector, it's Poisson disputed error, etc. So you can actually say uh, whether you have too much information in the system or not. So what you do is you mix these two states. Mathematically it means you have cross derivatives and all kinds of nasty stuff in there. And you can remove everything that has too much information. It sounds kind of crazy, right? It's just that the maximum information in any picture you have is when two pixels never correlate. That means you need to describe every pixel. 
that's a lot of information. So uh, that means because noise is of that order, it will always have more information uh, in the noise than in the actual picture. So you remove noise and then you affect this and you cycle this and voila, you get down, and I will show you later, we get down to one nanometer now. So here's an example, long time ago, of an antibody uh, uh, rotating and going through 10 cycles of refinement. And you can see how efficient the noise is removed <laughs> through the cycles. So this antibody is actually here and up in that corner you can see it's actually binding uh, to here. It binds to this antigen. <laughs> All right, um, here's another example I did, this is also a long time ago, of the glucocorticoid receptor. And I realized these are two supposed to be identical molecules in the same purified sample. And when you do the 3D reconstruction, you can realize that the different domains in the structure, like you see, particularly in this one, in relationship to the bigger bulk at the end, they point in different directions. Which means that there is internal dynamics in, in the structure, which makes it very difficult for anybody trying to, for instance, crystallize this or something. So nobody has been able to crystallize the entire glucocorticoid receptor. But they have crystallized this piece and the middle piece, but no longer, not yet, the back part here, because it seems to vary also. But tomography, where you don't average naturally, uh, it doesn't matter. You see what you see in there. So we pushed all this better and better and better as we were here. And this is an example of catalase when I really started to uh, doubt myself. Because uh, as you can see, here's a crystallographic structure of catalase. And you can count one, two, three, four, five different helices. Here's an example of one of our, our reconstructions. And you can count the same helices, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this one looks kind of funny in this area, and this is another one too. And to my horror, I realized that even if you get to high resolution on, on these individual ones, the dose shoots away randomly in, in these particles. So the curation of all this is what single particle people had already figured out a long time ago, you average. All right. If you average many of them, the error where the electrons have shot away some part of the structure uh, gets uh, averaged out. So I was thinking, how do we get to that? Because the point, the point of tomography is like you can see in a solution all the different molecules, and what do you do with them? So um, we went, went to different. Uh, way to do it. So we started this, uh, another real project with synaptotagmin. And synaptotagmin is a molecule that uh, here depicted in two more or less identical images here. Uh, so the synaptotagmin has uh, one peptide and another one, C2A, C2B. B is larger than A. And then there's a long tail that goes to a vesicle. And here it's drawn in a different way into the vesicle. And the point is that these two synaptotagmin domains, they are dependent on calcium. So when there is calcium present, somehow they get to be very close to each other and they actually bind to a membrane down here, a uh, plasma membrane, and it's thought that that helps to pull this vesicle down here. So first of all, this vesicle is a synaptic vesicle. So that's where 
your uh, brain is keeping your nerve signals. It's pretty good if you can make use of it so you can think. Okay. Well, down here is the uh, synapse border. So this action is thought to, with calcium, to bring these two together in some way so that they can bring the vesicles down and then there can be fusion with this membrane here and the fusion down to this one and the contents can be released. It's a complicated procedure, so down here I don't think one knows exactly what's going on. But it's been uh, an endless amount of hypothesis around <laughs> what synaptotagmin does here. <coughs> All right, so we've been interested in finding out what does synaptotagmin look like actually uh, in there. It's, it's not very big, so uh, we were not sure first whether we could see it. Uh, to make a short story even shorter, this is a car caricature of it. So you have the synaptic vesicle, the two uh, calcium containing or could contain calcium peptides of the synaptotagmin, which is the sum of these two, and then binding to the synaptic cleft. Uh, this one has to understand the dynamics in this process to be able to figure out uh, how to moderate this. Uh, this is a nerve signaling thing. So if you make a drug in here, for instance, it's probably not good if it's on or off, but maybe 35% off or 67% off, something like that, to moderate it a bit. Otherwise, maybe there are very big effects on your thinking. So it has been a lot of speculations uh, circulating in the press um, about these two domains, how they are and how they can be related to each other in different geometric configurations, uh, all trying to explain how uh, when there is a lot of calcium, for instance, they can bind and create a possibility for the synaptic vesicle to release the signal. All right, so it turns out that the um, crystallographic procedures have been used to solve the two when there is a lot of calcium and <clears throat> another version where there is little calcium. But these are only two, uh, uh, two different conformations and uh, the question is which work and which doesn't work or how much in between can it be to work? That you can't see. With, with crystallography, they've been able to pinpoint two versions here. Uh, not yet, though, with SPA, because it's not big enough. So here's an example of how big it is. So the two parts in it um, are such that this the smaller protein is just 15 kilodalton, and the other one is uh, 17 and a half kilodalton. So altogether, not a very large molecule. Uh, and at, at least of this date, there, I don't think there has been any attempts with cryo-EM and single particle uh, on this for the reason of the size, of course. Uh, the molecule is also rather small. Uh, you can see 47 angstrom, uh, roughly in size, etc. So it, it's a, a rather small thing. But the major issue with uh, single particle is the alignment of different parts. And when it's uh, small molecules, almost impossible to align. Now, we are not dependent on that in tomography because we have our goal markers. So we can actually continue and seeing all those small things. So here is uh, uh, from the PDB database, uh, the uh, 5 CCH uh, showing the open configuration, so no calcium. And here is another version that uh, I actually put up, but it's a very small picture. Looks almost like a butterfly when they are close together. So this is with calcium. Now, 
we then designed a new way to do this uh, procedure. So we have our initial reconstruction and then we do something called mining. So what, just one tilt series and you reconstruct it and this uh, constrained refinement comet is super efficient to remove noise. So you can actually go into the reconstruction area over the entire specimen that you did and, and ask for a molecule with a size of 35 kilodalton, plus minus a few percent. And then in this particular case, it fished out uh, a few hundred of them, uh, but they are all in different conformations. However, when you analyze all of them, you find out that they form clusters. So there are uh, a number of ways that the molecules like to be in, in there. And of course, if it's a cluster, then even I could say, well, it may be, make sense to average within a cluster. So we proceeded that way. So um, we had all these different structures that we clustered and then you can make averages and fit them to the X-ray structure and then you can discuss the model. So here's an example. Uh, so in this case, uh, we had 771 particles of about 35 kilodalton in one experiment, one, one tilt series. And then in this case, uh, cluster seven contained 105 particles, quite a number of them. And it looks like this uh, with uh, Fourier shell correlation. You can see that it's with the 0, 1, 4, 3 criterion, it's 10.0 angstrom resolution on that one. Another one uh, had slightly worse. This one is 11.8 angstrom resolution and the two uh, peptides are much further apart from each other in this case. So one can actually go on with this and in this particular um, picture you see uh, X-ray experimental research, that's the sort of greenish yellow here. And the other one is computational prediction because people have come up with this alpha fold version where you can predict uh, the structure. And here one can see that uh, alpha fold um, is kind of good, but not in all aspects. So alpha fold can be used, yes, but you have to know how to reinterpret it to make sense out of it. So here are more uh, alpha fold predictions. Uh, this one is for uh, the monomer, domain C2A and C2B. And then you start to make a dimer and a tetramer. And this is with calcium, so they are close together. And on this one, you talk about the same um, prediction again by having them further apart. Well, we have looked at those and compared with, with uh, what we see from tomography and then one can see that maybe the prediction is not so good when the structure is complicated. Uh, so it needs a lot more work uh, simply for, for that to be trustworthy yet. Um, and if you take the full length uh, synaptotagmin, you know it has a tail that goes all the way up to be anchored in the synaptic vesicle. And then it gets even worse, I think, in terms of um, how much you can believe of the structure. But you, we can use Comet to predict protein structures. And here comes a twist on this. Uh, so Comet can be used to um, predict actual conformations of complex structures and conformational changes of the proteins while interacting with other proteins. So with the artificial intelligence, at least at this point, it can't really predict complex structures and conformational changes. But geometrically constrained molecular dynamics can be used to fit such structures to our structures. 
And there is a researcher from Toronto who works in Riken right now, Adnan Shlioka, who has developed this. So um, if we compare, here is a probe number one. We use one of our structures, one of our um, uh, complexes that we've, we find, a cluster. Uh, and we search among all the generated um, uh, PDB maps that uh, Adnan Shloka can predict through his constrained molecular dynamics. And we find a fit. And it corresponds to, if you remove the density, it corresponds to exactly this kind of distribution. And you can actually look at another probe it fished out another of their predictions, and it's this version. And finally, a third one. Uh, here is our structure, and here is the probe. It, uh, here is the probe, and here is the molecular dynamics generated structure, and this corresponds to the atomic distribution. So, it means uh, yes. Uh, at this point. One can have, uh, in this case, we had only about 1,200 structures that Adnan had predicted, but it can be 100,000 or more. And uh, you can use any of these cluster structures to, as probes and search through. It's pretty quick, actually. And then the interesting part is that you fish out all those possible variations of the molecular dynamics that actually works. And then you can discard all the other ones uh, and, and uh, predict which molecular dynamics trees you should pursue for further, more, even more accurate fitting. So it's an interesting uh, twist to this, I think, where tomography suddenly becomes possible to, in some ways, to interpret to high resolution. So what we're aiming after is to understand how to go about and find out how the molecules dance in there. Because when drug uh, companies generate a new drug, uh, they might not want to completely stop the action or uh, twist somebody on to 100%. They might want you know, a small dance, uh, a more reduced dance. Now, that was the dance you were after, right? <laughs> So um, I think that it, it, when I first did this thing uh, analytically on antibodies, uh, we modeled the whole procedure. It was so complicated, I realized we won't be able to do it on, on very complicated uh, molecular changes. But in this case, we can figure out uh, directly from molecular dynamics uh, what has happened to the molecule and which ones fit fit to what cluster. Now, the clusters we've been working with is from one TID series, but right now we're expanding it to work on pool data. So you can take 25 TID series, let's say with one chemistry upset, uh, subset, and you reconstruct and you see what clusters you have in there. Right? And then you can change a little bit on the pH or the salt concentration or whatever it is and so on. And if you want to know what happens if you put it in the body, which is a very interesting thing, right? You can take a biopsy. And then you can add your molecules to this biopsy and reconstruct what kind of clusters you actually have in the biopsy without doing the animal experiment. All right. So, uh, yeah, I think we actually do reach one nanometer. What's stopping us, actually? Well, it turns out that uh, Rina, who has been taking most of our photographs, uh, is limited by you know how accurate can you align the height adjustment in the microscope when you record the data. It's very critical, and she has become a master of that. So that's why we reached down, and so far our record uh, Fourier shell correlation structure is 9.3 angstrom, but. Uh, if we were able to figure out the focus, we would be able to go way further down. And there is this new technology that's coming up, 
which is called integrated uh, uh, something focus. IDPC STEM is a new STEM technique, which is not fully developed yet, but it works for single particle analysis at least to 3.6 angstrom. But in that case, when they make it work for tomography, there is no f focus issue. So then we can use the same technique to get to much higher resolution than we have it today. I would like to say that there are many contributors to this work. So Gunnar Wilken, he is sitting here, there. Uh, he has been important for us to sober up our uh, way of using some of the mathematics in Comet to a very important step where it's very accurate and can be used to high resolution. Uh, I did a test on, on uh, a nanoparticle, silver particle, actually a nanoparticle, and there you see the lattice. So you, you have the silver atom distance and see every silver atom in some area. So it's rather accurate on this kind of stuff. Um, well, Lars Jöran and I, we have been camping together since 1992. And you might remember him. He was here for many years and got retired two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, we continue to work with him on software development. And he and I will continue doing software development as I'm back as a, um, emeritus. But curiously enough, uh, so in 1992, not 1982, sorry, um, I arranged a course together with Richard Henderson at the MRC in Cambridge, and the course was running in Uppsala, and the best student at that course was Lars Jaran. <laughs> so that's why he ended up finally in my group. Uh, Ritesh, who is also here, there. Uh, he has been uh, doing tomography earlier with me, but uh, the latest thing is a single particle structure that we're uh, struggling with trying to get published right now. Uh, and then we have our master for data collection, Rina, uh, who is now uh, continuing here at OIST in the support section, imaging section. Uh, and we also have this ongoing collaboration with Adnan Schlocka, uh, who is uh, developing this very exciting new version of molecular dynamics, where you don't have to calculate things that don't have anything to do with the real world. Yeah, so it's not completely random as the way it's been developed so far. I did develop a lot of this stuff uh, as I was at Karolinska Institute, uh, but lately uh, it's been here, it hoist. So I have got a lot of numerous generous grants in Sweden and also some very, very large grants here in Japan. Um, so I'm very happy, uh, I've been privileged, I think, and I'm also very happy that my collaborators over the years have new positions. <laughs> continue torment everybody else. Uh, well, that's about it. Uh, I'm happy to have questions if you have any.